Welcome and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Evelyn McKinney and I'm a program officer at Rural LISC on the economic development team. Rural America is home to a diverse spectrum of over 60 million people, from millennials to retirees, from farmers to healthcare workers, to high-tech manufacturers, supporting families who, whose local roots stretch back generations. The pandemic has also upended the entire rural ecosystem with increased housing and food insecurity, inadequate broadband service, a pivot in the entire education system to all virtual learning, and also small businesses are suffering. Significant challenges remain, but also is the ability to solution. Rural America needs us now more than ever. The CDBG CV Rural Economic Development Quick Guide is a resource to help states and rural grantees identify eligible activities and programs to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the disruption of the coronavirus pandemic using CDBG-CV and 2019 and 2020 entitlement funds. Over the course of the next 90 minutes, you will learn about the provisions in the CDBG CV Rural Quick Guide, eligibility and compliance, systems level impact, state grantee perspective, and how a local boots on the ground Community Development Corporation designed a solution. From Local Initiative Support Corporation, Justin Archer Birch is the Program Director of Workforce Development at Rural List on the Economic Development Team. He will provide an overview of the CDBG-CV Rural Economic Development Quick Guide. From Department of Housing and Urban Development, Corey Schwartz, is the, is the Deputy Director of HUD's States and Small Cities Division, which administers the Community Development Block Grant Program for states. Corey will speak about the regulatory waivers and alternative requirements for eligibility and compliance in the CDBG CV notice that affects rural economic development. He will also note what de economic development related requirements haven't changed from the annual CDBG. From Local Initiative Support Corporation, Elizabeth Dimitru is the National Director of Economic Development uh, where she oversees initiatives that advance inclusive economic development. Using a practitioner's guide, uh, recently published by LISC and Next Street, Building Organizational Capacities in Service of Equitable and Inclusive Small Business Ecosystems, Elizabeth will discuss how ecosystem can help you advance your goals. From the Kansas Department of Commerce, Kayla Savage is the Director of the Community Development Division and a member of the Executive Leadership Team. Debbie Beck is the CDBG program manager with over 35 years of direct experience in CDBG. Together, Kayla and Debbie will share the Kansas Department of Commerce state grantees perspective on using CDBG-CV funds to support rural communities, economic development and recovery efforts. They will highlight how to use partners like regional planning commissions to help implement programs, supporting small businesses through working capital grants and touching on the tools subrecipients could use uh, to help or use, for example, like DOB verification and worksheets um, to help with sample applications. And last but certainly not least, we have from hailing from Franklin County, Massachusetts, uh, Amy Shapiro. 
She is the business development director uh, with the Franklin County Community Development Corporation, and she will provide a real-time example of an ecosystem at work. Several towns and cities in their region asked them to administer their CDBG microenterprise grant programs. They were contracted to dis disperse uh, just over $900,000 of forgivable loans, um, ranging from 3,000 to 25,000 per business, uh, along with a 10% service fee. By working with these businesses, they were also able to connect with and provide small business technical assistance and supports. After we hear from each of our presenters, we will then shift into a panel discussion to, to address some of the content related questions uh, that you've been asking um, in the Q&A box. So if you haven't started, but you have a pressing question, be sure to enter it in the Q&A box. Let's get started, shall we? Our first presenter of the day is Justin Archer Birch. Thanks so much, Evelyn, and thanks for the panel for joining us today. So how about we just dive right in with the CDBG CV guide and just talk about what's in it. So rural communities across the country have felt the impact of COVID-19 um, pandemic in unique ways. But the one thing we do want to elevate is that there's a lot of commonality between urban and rural. So many of the difficulties that we see in urban environments are also happening in rural, but it does hit differently. We do know that rural communities um, have unique differentiators. So one, there's fewer resources that, that tend to aggregate in rural places. We also know that rural tends to be philanthropically underserved and that population-based formulas um, can sometimes keep out additional public leverage dollars. But we do believe that with supplemental allocation of CDBG, CB funds, grantees can grow and support efforts that drive recovery and growth in communities that have felt the brunt of the pandemic's economic fallout. So the one thing that we, we like to elevate is that rural communities still build their economies on main streets. Commercial corridors and downtowns and rural areas are suffering and a coordinated effort to bring them back is crucial. Um, some of the things that we, we sort of see happening in rural places is that recovery does lag and it especially lags in comparison to their urban counterparts. In many rural places, we are still in a recovery mode from the 2008-2009 economic um, crisis. And we also know that this pandemic exacerbated inadequate access to capital, the lack of broadband activity, and the lack of support to vulnerable industries rural is reliant on. Um, but there are ways that we can sort of combat this. One, we could invest more in flexible capital to support operations. We could invest in more place-based approaches, especially like those with streetscape improvements, incubators, and co-working spaces. And lastly, we could be using it to invest in marketing campaigns that could help drive foot traffic back to awaiting businesses in rural communities. So what are some of the ways that states and state administrators can use this funding um, to support? So one is to directly support small business. Um, direct financial assistance to small businesses is key during this time. Uh, supporting entrepreneurial support organizations, those who, who sort of elevate um, capacity building and dollars to uh, small businesses, especially um, those sub-recipients, uh, helping states could help them effectively manage and become stronger partners in the delivery of state CDBG funding. Uh, supporting community development financial, op uh, financial institutions, which provide flexible capital to keep businesses afloat supporting rural innovation hubs, providing that technical assistance access points for rural businesses to innovate and grow. And lastly, supporting council of governments, which in rural places play various roles in ensuring access to capital and public funds. So let's talk about some of these ways that the funding can be utilized to support these small businesses. One, we can increase further access to flexible capital. 
interventions tailored to meet the needs of individual communities will have the greatest impact and providing flexibility and program design will allow for the kind of customization needed for these subrecipients to address their particular unmet needs. Each rural unit of general local governments could and should build on its strengths and focus on the areas where lo locational advantages, existing partnerships and growing industries and occupations intersect. Grantees can combine many of these interventions below into a single program, you know, i.e. A, a grant or a loan program. So developing those loan and those grant programs, states can also develop partnerships with banks, philanthropy and CDFIs to develop loan funds to aid in small business recovery. By leveraging that expertise, resources and networks of partners, the public sector can maximize its impact. Grant programs are another source of capital for small business relief and recovery. Even in some cases, states can design grant programs to support a sector heavily impacted by COVID-19, think the accommodation industry. We could also use it to provide financial coaching and loan packaging. A financial coach works with small business owners to help them navigate their personal and business finances. They create financial goals and develop a financial plan to meet those goals. The purpose of investing in those financial coaches is to help businesses better understand their financial needs and be better positioned to secure the capital needed to keep um, businesses and personal lives financially healthy. By layering in that financial coaching to other business support services, states and their subrecipients can improve outcomes and coaches can integrate financial education into existing small business programming offered by technical assistance providers. The money can also be invested into micro lending. Online micro lenders provide products particularly helpful for small businesses. In addition, crowdfunding platforms like Kiva help small businesses who may not be loan ready but still need access to those resources. Kiva provides loans ranging from $1,000 to $15,000 to help individuals looking to start or expand those businesses. And businesses can also use those micro loans to retool or pivot their operations and or access new revenue streams in response to COVID-19. Access to industry professional mentorship opportunities. This one's really key. Businesses are facing many challenges and some will require specialized support to survive. Access to special services can support a business and opportunities, provides a platform for business owners to address more challenges related to running a business with those who have overcome similar issues themselves. These resources are particularly useful when coupled with grants and loans. Last is investing in digital inclusion for rural communities, and this has layovers into workforce development. Broadband can have a significantly positive economic impact on rural communities. The pandemic has revealed that businesses that could pivot to a virtual marketplace shielded themselves from some of the worst fallouts of the crisis. Increasing broadband access to rural places by investing in broadband networks, along with digital literacy and access points for entrepreneurs, further ensures ability to compete in a digital marketplace and be more resilient to shelter in place orders brought on by pandemics and other natural disasters that commonly impact rural communities. Ultimately, broadband investments also allow for greater ability for rural small businesses to grow, manage, and market their enterprise at large. State administrators can also use this funding to support workforce development. Investing in flex code employment is something that's going to be, you know, just growing more and more into the future. And digital is going to underpin so much of a 21st century workforce um, in rural communities. Also supporting that digital upskilling, especially at post-secondary institutions, um, will go a long way. And then supporting and leveraging planning and development districts, especially in how they're using WIOA Title II within the literacy component moving forward. Lastly, what states and state administrators can do is invest in place-based approaches. So district assessment and planning. District level relief and recovery efforts will be most successful if informed by market conditions and grounded in local reality. A commercial district diagnostic or strategic planning process will ensure that those changed with the revitalization of the business district are targeting the initiatives and programs that will have the greatest impact. This work may include conducting interviews with stakeholders, data analysis, 
business and resident outreach and engagement. The output of the planning process is a targeted roadmap for recovery specific to local conditions that can be used to access and deploy additional resources. Capacity building. Business districts often have a group charged with its revitalization and development. Examples include Main Street organizations, district management groups, business improvement districts, chambers of commerce, and merchant associations. These are the trusted entities on the ground coordinating with local government agencies. Police, sanitation, transportation, and overseeing planning, marketing events, beautification efforts, and capital projects in the district. Investing in these groups, many of whom suffered the financial impact of COVID-19 themselves, builds the infrastructure on the ground to support long-term relief and recovery. Marketing and events. District marketing and open for business campaigns and events that celebrate local history and culture are two ways to drive foot traffic to small businesses in the business districts in your state. Small businesses will benefit from the increased revenue while local residents have opportunities for civic engagement. Events often support local artists, food vendors, and musicians in addition to small business. Infrastructure and capital projects. Investments in infrastructure and street streetscape improvements can be an effective way to enhance the experience that residents and visitors have with the business district, encouraging them to visit more often and extend the length of their visits. Grants for downtown anchors, civic and cultural institutions, community facilities and facade and building improvements can all serve as catalysts to district revitalization while supporting existing institutions. Lastly, the development of co-worker spaces within a central business district. Investing in these central business districts um, in dedicated maker, thinker, and co-worker spaces that help concentrate efforts, ideas, and enterprise in rural markets would help rural communities build the networks and ecosystems that support small businesses and sole proprietors. Easier access points through these hubs will help align more private and public partnerships such as planning and development districts, small business development and technical centers, and private enterprise to provide services, investments, and collective capacity. These spaces could also prove valuable to urban dwellers seeking less densely populated markets that offer lower overhead and cheaper production costs while also allowing for rural communities to net new populations and businesses to their markets. The last thing that state administrators can do is partner. This is one of the simplest ones, I think, on the slide deck. And really thinking through who are those anchor institutions in rural places who have the capacity and bandwidth to carry this work over. Some of these local rural partnerships could be community colleges, local rural chambers of commerce, including chambers of commerce that intersect with rural and BIPOC communities, Main Street associations, extension services, Every state is going to have a rural extension service connected to an institution of higher learning who already know the key partnerships that are available in rural communities that are able to innovate with this funding. Lastly, the Federal Economic Development Commissions. Lots of you exist in states that are covered by these. Good case examples are the Delta Regional Authority that cover the eight state regions that touch the Mississippi River. Um, Appalachia Regional Commission, you know, they run the Atlantic seaboard, but cover huge territories, but often have good community trust relationships. And the Northern Border Regional Commission is another great example of how you can utilize those partnerships to go ahead and seed these funds into rural places. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is listed below. But at this time, we want to go into some of our other panelists. So why don't we pivot over to Corey with HUD to talk a little bit through um, how to use this money and what are some of the, the ways it, 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 or ways it can be used. So Corey, do we want to move on to your slide? I'm ready. There we go. Well, I think we have, we, we have you teed up with a quick introduction there. Um, and then there will be follow up and how you can contact Corey at the end of his slide deck. But we'll go ahead and jump over to the next one. Sure. Thank you, Justin. Uh, my name is Corey Schwartz. Um, I am the Deputy Director of the States and Small Cities Division here at HUD headquarters. We administer the state CDBG and CDBG CV programs. Um, 
So most of the funds, CDBG funds that flow to rural communities come through the state program. So today I really wanna to touch on the high points, um, kind of the regulatory items about what's different in CDBG CV and what's the same um, from CDBG, the annual CDG, CDBG program that you should remember in the context of rural economic development. So in terms of what's new uh, from the CARES Act and from the CDBG CV notice, the big one, obviously, and uh, Evelyn mentioned this up top, is that all CDBG CV activities must prevent, prepare for, or respond to coronavirus, what we call our PPR tieback. Uh, and that's in the CARES Act, it's a, it's a statutory requirement. Uh, we have provided some, uh, uh, some TA materials and the CDBG, uh, the uh, PPR tieback flexibilities guide. That runs through a number of different uh, activities and how they can meet the PPR, PPR tieback and some examples, not just limited to economic development. Uh, the critical thing in keeping in mind PPR is that uh, grantees have to document um, how an activity meets the PPR tieback. There's no specific step-by-step -step test or specific criteria that HUD has set out in the CDBG CV notice um, in determining whether an activity has, has responded, uh, prevent, prevented, prepared for, or responded to coronavirus. It's really on the grantee to make that determination. And that's the biggest difference in terms of eligible activities in the CDBG CV notice. Um, Otherwise, there aren't many changes to the, to the activities. Most economic development activities are gonna be, uh, will still fit under the regular uh, CDBG economic development or microenterprise activities. So that hasn't changed. If, you, if you're familiar with those activities, then CV is not gonna be different in terms of the types and the range of activities that you can carry out. As far as national objectives go, uh, the CDBG CV notice eased uh, a presumption for job creating activities. Um, in the, for the regular CDBG program, there is a distinction between job for the presumption for activities carried out in a central business district and those outside a central business district. And the poverty threshold for areas uh, activities in a central business district is 30%. CDBG CV lowers it to align uh, to the non CBD uh, 20%. In terms of public benefit standard, um, activities, economic development activities carried out under 105A17 of the Housing and Community Development Act, um, which we often refer to as, this, as special economic development activities, are subject to the additional public benefit standard for job creating activities, we've raised that from $50,000 to $85,000. And for activities that benefit a particular area, we've raised from $1,000 to $1,700 uh, per person in that area. We've also wiped out the aggregate public benefit standard for all economic development activities um, under a particular grant. In terms of other requirements that affect rural economic development, of course, um, the CDBG CV notice allows states to carry out activities directly throughout their state. Funds do not need to uh, go through a method of distribution to non-entitlement UGLUGs. Um, there is the non-entitlement set aside where a portion of funds have to be set aside for use by non-entitlements. Um, but for the remainder of those funds, states can carry out activities directly. There's also a, um, the flexibility in terms of record keeping requirements for jobs, um, instead of requiring household documentation, uh, we only, we call, we have documentation for what we call a household of one, which is only the person receiving uh, the job that is created or retained. That's gonna make it easier for businesses and grantees to document that they are meeting the low mod jobs requirement. And of course, duplication of benefits, um, does not apply to the regular CDBG program, but does apply to CDBG CV. And that's to ensure that uh, recipients of CDBG CV funds are not receiving duplicative assistance uh, for, uh, for the activity that they're carrying out. Um, we have re uh, released a number of um, 
TA materials and other reference materials on duplication benefits. So I encourage you and urge you to review those to make sure that your economic development activities comply with the duplication of benefit requirements. Next slide. Things to remember, uh, microenterprise assistance regulations um, have not changed. So it's another way to support economic development um, through activities um, that are not the 105A17 or the special economic development activities. It avoids having to go through the public benefit standard, which is, um, it makes it easier to carry out those activities. Um, also want to point out, and Justin alluded to this, is that you can, grantees, communities can carry out economic development without specifically using the economic development reg or the microenterprise assistance regs. You can also use um, eligible activities such as public facility improvements, the obvious one being um, public streetscape improvements, sidewalk improvements to allow for uh, outdoor restaurant seating and other commerce to take place um, in areas that um, are experiencing coronavirus surges or there are um, state or local laws that are limiting uh, physical distancing or other, um, in any way to responding to coronavirus. Um, you're not limited to the quote unquote economic development activities in the RICS. So that's, that's something important to keep in mind. Um, finally, and also important is that the cross-cutting requirements that apply to the CDBG program, such as Davis-Bacon requirements and environmental requirements, remain. Um, those are not waived. So those are, that's also, of course, very important to keep in mind as you, as you carry out the, your activities. Next slide. Again, what, I, what I've talked about a lot today um, is, is not new information. It's information that has been in uh, a lot of our TA material uh, that we've re reiterated in a lot of webinars. Um, so I encourage you to go back to um, other quick guides that relate to rural economic development, obviously the Rural Economic Development Quick Guide, um, but also if you haven't looked or if you haven't looked in a while at some of our other materials, uh, be sure to look at those because they may give you some ideas uh, or give you a better understanding of ways in which you can carry out economic development in rural areas, even if it's not uh, kind of the direct Rural Economic Development Quick Guide. Um, and also TA materials that aren't necessarily CV specific um, will also inform your, your designing and implementing your plans. The economic development toolkit and slides on uh, HUD exchange, uh, as well as the microenterprise assistance toolkit. Next slide. And I will hand it off to uh, Elizabeth. Brent, are we going back to Justin or are we gonna do Elizabeth? No, we're sliding on over to Elizabeth. So. Right. I am pleased to introduce my colleague um, who it leads our national economic development team at LIST. So Elizabeth, um, I think, is going to dive into a little bit of the roles here. So Elizabeth, please feel free to take it away. Thanks, Justin. Uh, next slide, Evelyn. So as Evelyn mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, I'm the Director of Economic Development here at LISC. Really pleased to be with you here today. Um, I'm going to go over building organizational capabilities in service of equitable and inclusive small business ecosystems. And why am I going to do that? Uh, one of the things that Justin referenced in his presentation was that businesses need more than just capital. They need support. They need technical assistance. They need mentorship, access to new business opportunities. And there's a range of players in every market that provide that expertise. And so with limited time, with limited resources, it's important to understand who's performing those activities in your market, where there are gaps, and how we can collectively provide support to help businesses recover and grow. The, the playbook um, or practitioner's guide that's referenced here is one that was published uh, last month uh, in, and published by Liska Next Street. And we really thought through why we were developing this guide and who we were developing it for. Um, so we took a practitioner's angle. Really, we wanted to show and highlight best practices that led with equity and inclusion to help uh, people access local capacities and gaps. So what's existing in your market and where are those gaps? And how can CDBG CV or other funds 
help fill those gaps? Um, how can we use the partners that we're supporting through this work to help better connect them through an ecosystem building uh, model? Uh, the guide outlines the potential roles in which local stakeholders can adapt or intensify their efforts. I love this because every time I look at that slide, I, I remember and, I'm, um, and I start thinking about people that are part of the ecosystems that I work in that I hadn't thought of before. So I think it's a really uh, helpful and useful thing to, um, to look at. The, the guide provides decision-making criteria to identify appropriate ecosystem roles for organizations and their partners, and it offers guidance on how to create an implementation plan to execute. Uh, you can download the slide, the guide and worksheets um, in the presentation, and there's a, a webinar recording on our website. I will not go into everything that's in this guide today, but wanted to give a little bit of a primer and help apply it to some of the things you may be working on. Next slide. So these are terms and things that have been kind of you know, floating around for a while now. And so we wanted to start with grounding um, ourselves in some shared definitions. So some of these are probably new to you, some aren't. I wanted to highlight that when we say practitioner, you know, we mean an organization with an interest or strategy to support small businesses. And so that can include local and municipal government, grant makers, anchor institutions, business and community-based organizations and associations. I know that sometimes when we say practitioner, we're not including all of these groups. We don't necessarily think of all of these groups. And so I wanted to make sure you were able to see yourselves in the discussion today. As for ecosystem, um, it's a set of conditions and support that all entrepreneurs need to thrive, to launch and expand their businesses, and also to sustain shocks by things like the pandemic. Um, I like describing it as conditions and supports. I think we sometimes think about the supports. I think the conditions are the most or equally as important. And I want to encourage you guys to think about your own communities and the conditions that exist there that make certain resources easier to take root and help to uh, focus attention on things um, that are most applicable in your markets. And then lastly, equity. Um, it's an approach that ensures that all small businesses have access to the same opportunities, um, recognizing that there's advantages and barriers in different markets for different people and seeking to write the unequal starting place for business owners. Next slide. When we talk about ecosystem engagement, we talk about the who and the how. We wanna make sure that there are inclusive voices from small business owners to community leaders. We wanna understand who those gatekeepers are of existing ecosystem priorities. And if they're the right ones, who's having those conversations, who's leading them and who's missing from the table. Um, and then also, you know, how can funders um, across sectors be better brought into this work? In terms of how to engage, there are things that are cost-effective. There are things that are like super deep and you can decide what works best for you. But sometimes just having interviews and focus groups and informal convenings to get a better understanding of what exists locally is all you need. Um, there are also you know, very high tech ecosystem building and mapping efforts. And there are some examples in the guide on some sort of low touch, easy and kind of quick uh, things that you can do on your own. Next slide. So the strategy for, for supporting a small business ecosystem begins with understanding the local small business ecosystem. It's taking stock, it's doing an assessment, then it's figuring out where you wanna focus. You can't do everything at once. And I think that, especially when you're working with a number of partners, being able to show some early wins is super important. So I think that you know super focused is, uh, is the way to go. Operationalizing a plan and managing it for success it's not enough to create a plan, you really have to manage it. And there should be ongoing communication and community engagement throughout the process. Next slide. So I wanna stop and just kind of focus on this slide a little bit. Uh, these are the ecosystem roles and definitions that I referenced earlier. Some are direct operators, all the way to intermediary, and there's a lot of people in between. And I want you to think about who these people are in your market and how you can utilize their resources, their expertise, their enthusiasm to support small businesses. 
we all sort of first think about the service provider, the people providing direct TA, coaching, training to small businesses, or the capital provider that's distributing capital in the form of debt, equity, or grants. Um, we sometimes forget that, you know, you need the innovators. You need to understand, you know, what research is out there and who's thinking about the new product and offerings that small businesses might be needing um, and where those conversations are happening. Similarly, um, capacity builders, funders, conveners, advocates, investigators, these are all different roles that exist within your market and identifying them and bringing them into the conversation and bringing them to the table is really important. Next slide. These are the capabilities of different roles. These are the types of things that they really bring to the table um, and just really highlights the importance of a comprehensive approach to the work that really celebrates and integrates different voices and understands that different people will come to the table with different offerings and to celebrate those. So anything from you know awareness building, you might have a champion that can market frame and tell the story of the work that's happening locally. They might not be a direct service provider, but they're really an important part of the small business ecosystem. Next slide. This outlines some of the more uh, obvious uh, capabilities for each role. And so this isn't always true, but this is a really great place to start in terms of understanding what role different partners can play. Next slide. So what can you do to support your ecosystem locally? Create alignment. There are so many different people doing a number of things. They're busy, they're dedicated, getting them to talk to each other, refer clients across their platforms um, so that businesses can get different services depending on their needs. And especially in this climate, as their needs change um, so that we can create more equitable ecosystems. It's more um, efficient at the end of the day. And so once we get people to think about the value and the benefit of working locally, um, the, the easier it is to, to do this work. And you all are in a, in a great position because you're funding many of these people and you're supporting a lot of their work and their programs. And so um, utilizing you know, your ability and um, your sort of support from them. So the, the first thing, as I mentioned, was to identify resources needed for strategy building. Resources come in different forms. Sometimes it's just time and energy um, and you don't necessarily need a lot of research or data to help move you to the next step. Diagnosing, uh, diagno diagnose a path forward and review past small business ecosystem assessments using the practitioner's guide. So those will give you some examples. Hopefully there's something there that would work for your community, but also think about you know, what's been done in the past and um, try not to duplicate efforts and sort of learn from uh, you know, prior engagements and then provide direct support to organizations with a track record of getting the work done. That's more important than ever now in the time that we're in, um, looking for new partners, supporting the ones that are there that are already doing the work and then better connecting them to each other. Uh, next slide. So that's just sort of a, a brief um, glance into the practitioner's guide. I hope you all have a chance to look at it. If there are any questions or if any questions emerge in the future, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, with any questions. All right, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kayla Savage and I'm the Community Development Division Director at the Kansas Department of Commerce. Um, I'm joined by Debbie Beck, our Program Manager for uh, Community Development Block Grant. As uh, Evelyn mentioned, she has been with the program for 35 years. Uh, so she is our resident expert for the program, and uh, I've only been here 16 months. So when, uh, when Rural List reached out about this opportunity to share with all of you um, kind of our state experience, I had to bring Debbie in because she is the resident expert. Um, so we're glad to be here this afternoon and to give you our perspective as a state uh, subrecipient of the CDBGCB dollars. Um, of note, uh, because of Debbie's leadership and her experience with the program and knowledge of the program, 
our state program, uh, I don't know how many times I'm going to say program today, it launched uh, May 12th of 2020. Um, so we put together a program in a very short amount of time um, under Debbie's leadership and also um, her team's experience as well. And focused on two areas. Uh, next slide, please. Go ahead, next slide. That's one picture of one of our recipients. Uh, so we had uh, economic development and then also meal programs. Um, Debbie is gonna go into really the details of how the program was designed. And then we will talk a little bit about um, some of our experiences as well. So what we determined when we were working on these projects, when we tried to develop it, um, to anybody that started working with the COVID Care Act fund was up front. We weren't given a whole lot of area to play with. And the state of Kansas through our department has always done economic development. We've been doing it for years underneath the regular CDBG program with program income. So we felt this was an area that we could touch on to really quickly um, because we had most of our criteria ready. So we came in and did this as a retained program only. Um, and what we did is this was before things changed and uh, we had the employees meet LMI. We also did this as there was micro enterprise and regular economic development, which we'll go over here in a minute. Um, each company awarded had to provide documentation to satisfy the requirements that they were meeting and retained as well as the expenditures, which we decided to go with working capital only. And in a few minutes, I'll tell you why we went with working capital only. And we picked those up since March 1 of 2020, which was um, the HUD approval date of when we can actually start picking up expenditures. And part of those, we did payroll, we did inventory, and non-city owned utilities, but we didn't want to benefit city or county governments um, as part of the process. So what we also required was each expense must be documented with an invoice and proof of payment. We did that up front when they drew the funds um, that they had to require all the information. Because at the stage of COVID, we had issues with going out and monitoring projects on site so that we could actually monitor these projects internally without actually having to go on site. And then when they did the second draw, we actually um, required proof that the payment had actually been made because what will happen in a lot of cases from past experience is if you give them the money and don't require an invoice, afterward you have a tough time ever getting one or proof that they actually paid it. They'll pay something else off first. Next slide. So how we determined we were doing this on the economic development side, we did micro enterprise, which was the one to five employees. Uh, which is basically set up as the regular guidelines. Um, our current program underneath the state requires 25,000 per job. Uh, we decided to go ahead and keep that because um, I'm guessing 95% of our companies that we deal with are all rural area and a lot of them only have 15 to 20 jobs. I think the max we have of anybody that came in under DCV was probably in the 40s. So we went ahead and kept with those guidelines, uh, maximum grant of 30,000 per company. So they had to have at least one and a half jobs to get the full maximum 30,000. And then we went with larger companies, which to us were six to 50 employees. Uh, we kept 35,000 per job retained, which is the regular program. And then we gave a maximum grant of 50,000 per company on that. Because what we did on these is we did these as grants. We did none of this as loan. So we figured um, we were just making a stop gap to help them get on their feet and that they should be able to go back to regular financing or low term um, once we did these. Next slide. What needed to be on file for the businesses? And what we did is we used the local regional planning commission or COGS as some of the other states call them. We also use the Certified Development Corps, which are part of SBA that also does a lot of banking information. So they also help with these projects. So what we did is in a lot of this, we provided the materials up front. We provided a sample application for the city or county to use. 
Uh, we contracted all of our projects through a city or county, through all non-entitlement areas of the state. We did not do any entitlement areas or bigger cities. And what we did is we provided a sample application for them to use that we had developed from um, taking pieces and parts of other emergency applications and put it together. Part of that um, application also dealt with duplication of benefit, but because we didn't figure it covered enough, we also had them sign duplication of benefit forms, which we also provide a copy of what that looked like that they signed so each company has one on file. The determination of level of review, I'll go through that on in a minute because of what we did with our environmentals on these. Um, employee certification form for each employee being retained. We had those signed up front when they did their applications. Um, we documented that each business must meet the 51% LMI requirement. And as I said earlier, they had to document each expense with an invoice and proof of payment. Our biggest issue that we probably ran into of anything is probably 95% of these companies had no DUNS number. And so we kind of inundated the DUNS hotline and everything <laughs> on their website trying to get DUNS numbers for all these companies. But we do have DUNS numbers on everybody. We required that before we could close them out. Um, so it was, some of it just took a little bit longer. And some of it, if you've ever gone out to a DUNS number on a website, you can go to a different couple of websites and one website will require you to do all kinds of things that will take you days. And then if you get the correct website, you can get it done in about 15 minutes. So it was kind of training people how to get information and those regional groups helped us get that because they had already done it for regular economic development projects. So um, they knew the tricks of how to get done snappers taken care of. Next slide. Um, what we did is this, we had uh, approximately $21 million total available to us. And what we did is, um, so far today, we've done CV 1, 2, and 3. Um, we've awarded $18.9 million to date. Um, we only did it to Kansas cities and counties that are eligible underneath our CDBG state grant dollars. The small cities, as I said, we did not do any entitlements um, because Kansas is so rural. Um, we figured that was the best need for it. We only have six entitlements. So we figured they were getting their own funding that we would keep it to the small city side. Um, in round one and two, the two categories we did was economic development and we did meals only. And the meals, how we did that is the meals were done by 51% LMI by survey or census of the community that was looking at the meal program. So it wasn't by who necessarily served because a lot of the meal programs were food pantry. So um, food pantry, anybody can go into the food pantry and get food, especially during COVID time, there was a lot more need for it. So um, when they justified that they were 51%, that's how we did our meal programs. Next slide. Um, as Kayla said, we launched this on May 12th of 2020, which was probably about two weeks after we were told we could actually start doing it. So we spent many an uh, hour getting everything directed and we actually, we were the first ones within our agency that actually went online for applications for this. So we learned a lot of things um, during this process to go electronic because we did not go by paper. Um, and so we awarded the first one is June 2nd of 2020, the second round in July 23rd of 2020, and round three, July 8th of 2021. Um, so we have approximately um, two to $3 million left in um, our projects. So we are looking at a round four. We have not decided what it's going to be, but we've determined locally, since we got some money back on the other projects that Round four, we're gonna to try to make it where we don't get money back de-obligated from projects. So we're trying to uh, make things more, I guess you could say complicated up front. So we get more data to prove that the money could actually be expended, which we did not do in some of the earlier rounds um, because of trying to do it so quickly. We had some of them, uh, we had done meal programs and then all of a sudden other agencies did meal programs. So we ran into issues with that. 
but we had on all of our projects, the maximum award for economic development was 150,000, 150, and that was for uh, microloan as well as regular economic development. And we made it a maximum $35,000 for meals. Next slide. This is probably the thing that we tried to do to make it the easiest for the state as well as for the localities on there and to make these projects go quicker. On our environmentals, all we did was working capital for food programs. We did no construction. So what we did is all of our projects were categorically excluded, not subject to. So which means all they had to do is public, uh, do a public notice that these were the types of projects that they were doing. All the clearance was done per company before they drew the funds. So when they would send us a request for payment, we would clear all the companies that they were drawing funds for at that time, as well as they provided the invoices of what they were gonna draw the funds for. What the grantee itself did was we required them to develop their own program and their priorities. So we as a state did not say, we think you ought to be doing grocery stores or you ought to be doing this and how much we gave them, how much money they had. We gave them what the limits were on the money. And then we said, you develop your own programs and your own priorities on what you feel the need is locally. So all decisions were made locally on the funds. It all went to the city or county commission. Um, like I said, we sent step on applications and job forms for them to use. And the regional administrators helped review those applications with the city and counties so that they could determine what was good and what was not. Of all of these, I can say we probably have a less than 2% failure rate of all of the companies that we benefited. Next slide. I'm going to go into the um, impact. So as Debbie mentioned, we've had three rounds of funding now that um, the state of Kansas has awarded to our um, sub-recipients or sub-grantees through the CDBGCB program. Um, she did mention, of course, the, the round four um, that we'll be looking, we will be looking at as well. And um, before we started uh, here today talking, Debbie and I were just discussing about some of the additional um, opportunities that we are looking at with round four, um, because I will, I will tell you anecdotally um, that in May of 2020, a lot of our communities and our businesses, uh, frankly, were desperate. Um, so we were in a we were in a shutdown at that point in time. And so um, our team here was really feeling the pressure uh, to get the dollars out, get the dollars out quickly and make sure that we set up um, programs that could be um, quickly implemented and utilized uh, very well as, as well. And so um, since additional CARES Act you know, funding has come out and now we're also looking at ARPA funds and how that impacts uh, CARES Act dollars as well. There are some additional opportunities now um, to think about in addition to the economic development and uh, small business working capital. Um, but so far, the numbers, the numbers tell the truth. They give a real good picture here. Um, you can see the 18.9 million, and then we've broken that down. Uh, 1,204 companies um, across the state of Kansas have benefited. And as Debbie already mentioned, these are mostly in rural areas of the state. And um, also the majority of them are exceptionally small businesses or micro enterprises, um, well under uh, 50 employees. And these are gonna be everything from daycares to gas stations, uh, to small manufacturing um, plants or operations that we got to keep those people employed and we got to keep their doors open. The 4,918 retained jobs and 4,180 of those jobs have been held by the low to moderate income um, people. And so we have um, far exceeded the requirement on that LMI um, requirement. So uh, we are glad to see that those, those funds have been impactful. Um, you can also see here with our uh, program income, 
um, as well, where we're at with that um, and how that's been, the, how that's impacted companies in the state. If you want to go to the next slide, um, we did drop the link here um, of our uh, website that we have developed for the CDBGCB program. Um, so if you go to that website, you're going to find a wealth of information, including all of the uh, documents and resources that, that Debbie mentioned with the application examples and duplication of benefits. So a lot of this information was utilized by those regional planning commissions and also the, the sub grantees or the sub recipients. Um, and there's also general information about our program and how we developed that. Um, I come from a Main Street background. We have a saying that we like to R and D, um, which actually stands for rip off and duplicate. So I would encourage those of you that are on the call and looking at your own programs and, and wanting to get some examples or um, ways to use this, please feel free to utilize that information um, that you have there. And uh, next slide is our contact information. So feel free to reach out to us. Uh, that's my cell phone number and uh, both of our emails are on there. Um, so we'd be happy to uh, join you know, any other groups that are looking for some more information um, and collaborate and help with any other lessons learned or suggestions um, or bounce ideas off of each other as well. And that uh, concludes our section. Um, Evelyn, I'm not sure, Justin, if you want to go um, next. Oh, yes. No, nope. yes, next. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to um, just jump right in. Um, next slide. Okay. That's our contact information. I also have some of my contact information at the end. Next slide, please. Great. So I'm going to jump right in with the impact um, that we've per that we implemented a CV program for 23 rural towns in six uh, with six hundred thousand dollars in Franklin County, which is in western Massachusetts, and with the city of North Adams, who contracted with us for one hundred and twenty thousand um, also west in western Massachusetts. Um, we began in June of twenty twenty. Our towns and cities used reprogrammed CDBG money to help owners in this immediate panic that was fast changing um, in how people lived and where their business was and what was happening. And owners just were contacting us 24 seven for help and support around strategy, assistance in how to apply for funding and just helping them with their skills to pivot on, to sell online and just a, a variety of ways, um, in, including, and this included different sectors. Plus we were adjusting ourselves to how to work remotely. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Um, so we started with re this, like I said, reprogram CDBG in the towns of Greenfield, Montague, Shelburne, and Buckland, who just jumped right in to assist their small business owners with these $5,000 forgivable loans that had to be spent within 90 days. And most of the funds were used for PPE, rent, utilities, insurance, inventory, and pivoting. Um, next slide, please. Um, the Franklin County CDC was well positioned to do program implementation. With our 40 plus years of working closely with business owners, uh, coaching them through our business lending program and our referrals really helped um, to help businesses start, stabilize and grow. We have very strong relationships regionally with CPAs and local lenders, business associations, that helped us be able to connect quickly. After the governor shut down the state on March 10th in 2020, we started helping business owners apply for PPP and EIDL and our state COVID funding, which worked with our regional and worked with our regional business advisors to offer webinars on pivoting businesses online, applying for COVID relief, managing all the different protocols 
and supply chain issues, et cetera. Uh, we took a 10% service fee, which really didn't cover enough time for the application of the forgiveness process, but we had other funding to cover our business counseling time that, that, met, that balanced the um, amount of time we were putting in with helping business owners in our coaching. Next slide, please. We could not have done this without the collaboration of our partners, the City of Greenfield's Economic Development Office, the North Adams Community Development Office, Breezeway Consulting for the towns of Shelburne and Buckland, and the Franklin Regional Housing Authority for the town of Montague. Greenfield organized monthly meetings with, our, with regional partners to share, which was really helpful as the CV program was rolling out. Um, on our level, we had peer collaborations with six peer groups around the state who were also implementing the CV around the state from the Cape all the way to the West. We met weekly for an hour, sometimes two hours. And you know, we would bring our quirky situations that we would all dissect to help determine eligibility and cost readiness, reasonableness. I gotta say, of the group, I had the most quirky situations. And I was so thankful to have a group to be able to work out the details with. You know, we were determining contracted labor as related to the criteria of five or fewer employees. And if a business gave out a W-9 to irregular contractors, how did that count? Um, we, every situation was unique. You know, it was very rare that we had something that was really streamlined. Um, and as new staff came on board to any of our groups, we supported the training and shared our forms and our processes. We didn't feel isolated um, because we were all working together. Next slide, please. Um, you know, um, to put it well, MJ Adams, our regional administrator from the city of Greenfield said it best. How do we spell success in Franklin County? Collaboration. Our stone soup effort quickly gave hope and resources to 75 micro enterprises. She said it so well because we are in a region that collaborates very well. And COVID really, we, we had this all in place before COVID. So when COVID hit, we were ready to rock. Next slide, please. Um, regarding outreach, you know, we, we did the basic tactics that most people would do. And we had a website, a web page on our website that had all the links and the frequently asked questions and forms. Uh, each town provided on their website links to our page. So, but the most useful was a recorded Zoom overview of the program with forms and process that the owners were able to watch anytime and they did. I kept hearing, I watched the video and it helped me understand. That was kind of weird because I was thinking what time of night were they watching it? We had an online application with additional documentation mailed, dropped off, or uploaded to a secure Dropbox into the business's folder. We put a secure box outside our front door at our office for after hour drops. We just tried to make it as easy as possible for people to provide, to com complete the application. Next slide. Once the income eligibility was confirmed, we had all the docs um, and we had all the docs. Next slide, please. Whoop, yeah. Once we had the income eligibility confirmed we, and we had all the docs, we, the packet went to our review team. We appreciated the time and commitment our two, review, our two retired reviewers gave to this project. We had a lawyer and a business owner who met weekly for one to two hours since October 2020 when we launched. Together with our CDC team, we evaluated the packet, the cost reasonableness, and if the business was relevant for the community. It was great to have an outside team with expertise. We saw how so many business owners couldn't compete, complete the profit and loss statements, had accumulated debt, that had significant challenges. This provided us access to more owners with deeper information about how they were operating so that we could provide one-on-one -on -one business assistance counseling. 
Next slide, please. When all the documentation was reviewed on our end and the project was then sent to the city or town for final approval, the award letter was sent for approval to the business owner and then they would re reply that they accepted the terms. Then the owner and I would meet to review the loan documents, the forgivable process, the status of the business so that we could provide additional assistance. And the best part, was handing the check and saying, is the check made out correctly? And what do you think about that amount? Many owners cried. Some said this saved their business. Some had never received any support like this and couldn't believe it was real. They thanked me for the hours that went into handholding through the process and all of them thanked everyone involved for who made this possible. Next slide, please. So here are some final thoughts. We have learned a lot. We wanted to get the funds out as fast as possible and immediately. We kept bumping into how the program was being interpreted, which slowed us down because many people were interpreting things differently. We didn't, we saw things shifting as time went on. Um, for example, you know, if an owner paid an invoice, is that reimbursable or only non-paid invoices was reimbursable. It took our state, you know, months to try to figure out which way that was going to go. Um, if owners, um, right. So another one was we wanted less paperwork. So I'm sure everybody has a feeling about this, but for us, there was, the owners had so much paperwork to submit on our end and getting the proper receipts was really challenging. Um, they would give us snapshots of just the numbers on the receipts, but not necessarily the name of the business or their bank statement. So we, there was just so many back and forth to get enough info, the accurate information in a, in a time saving way, but it was, um, it was just cumbersome. Um, and then again, because this program was rolling out so fast, we were inventing our forms and our some of our processes. It would have been really useful if in the future we understood what was expected from like say an audit or what could, or have the forms given to us from other, from the state or HUD that would help us just reduce the amount of hours that we, Put into creating these forms. But again, we worked all together, which in this collaboration made it so, so just made it so much easier um, because we weren't doing it ourselves. Next slide, please. Um, if you want to see our application and forms and other information that we've posted and how we've explained it to business owners, please visit our website. Um, we have funded many businesses in our rural downtown main streets. Businesses in our 24 towns were funded and spread out through all various industries. You can see some of the samples and the pictures that I've provided. Uh, next slide, please. Please reach out if you have any further to discuss. Thank you for the invitation to share my 18 months of really living the life here. Thank you. All right, thanks so much to our presenters. Um, I think we'll take a minute now to just ask you all to come off of mute. Um, and Evelyn's going to elevate a couple of the questions that have come to her and through the Q&A. All right, everyone, thank you for such a robust uh, discussion, such valuable information. Um, I see that the participants have, have stayed throughout the webinar. And there are some really great questions, um, many which have been answered, um, but there, is, there are a couple that, that um, we've not yet gotten to. So I am actually just going to jump right in if that's okay. The first question 
is, would you please share the done websites? Um, this particular individ individual says, we were running the same delay when we looked up the grantees done number. Thank you very much for your information. Yeah, Josephine, we would be, uh, Kansas here, we would be glad uh, to send that information um, out after the webinar if we can just work with the, the sponsors here and it can get, that way we get it to everybody um, so that everybody has that, that we'd be happy to send that along. Okay, that sounds great. If it's simply a website um, and you're able to drop that into the chat as well, uh, that would be helpful too. Okay. The next question, I can actually answer this. Uh, will this recorded webinar be available for review? The short answer is yes, but I'm going to, and I'm going to defer actually <clears throat> to a team member uh, so that he can tell you specifically uh, where it will be available to view. The recording in PowerPoint uh, will be made available on the HUD exchange on um, the training page for this webinar. Thank you very much. So here's a question that came in. Uh, this, Justin, this actually is for you. Uh, and the question is, why do we see less resources going to rural places? Yeah, I think there's a couple of answers to that. Um, for those of you who are more, you know, familiar with urban environments. Um, one, the philanthropically underserved is largely just because there's not a ton of pipeline into rural and there's, there's still knowledge gaps there that exist. Um, and it's sort of a, an equity point, you know, rural's 20% of the U.S. population, but only receives about 6% of private grant making. Um, tribal is, is even more worse. They're about 2% of the population, and I think only receive about 0.04% of private grant making. Um, so we're, we, we don't see a lot of that private leverage, but I think rural advocates are, are really pushing. We certainly have seen rural become more popular in the last five to six years um, with greater understanding from philanthropy to fund there. On the public side, you know, it's it can oftentimes be population-based formulas. So, you know, the feds have, have certain population-based formulas which reduce the amounts of dollars that go to rural states. And then at the state level, lots of states have population-based formulas which then allocate more dollars um, to urban environments than they do rural, which can create hardships generally because rural can be a heavier and a harder lift, um, especially due to our lack of concentration. Uh, but rural places matter and it's, a, it's an equity conversation. Um, and I feel like if we are 20% of the population and we're equity minded, we should at least be getting 20% of the resources uh, which I think links back to, to list sort of rural promise of pushing funders to make that commitment. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. I'm actually going to start. Um, I have a question. Let's start. Um, I, I can actually have a couple of questions. So I'm going to actually start with the boots on the ground. Franklin County CDC. Uh, Amy, thank you so much. You gave so much insight and certainly talked about, you know, the, the many challenges, not only as uh, facilitators or and or administrators of the grant, but you also started to speak a little bit about <clears throat> the small businesses and just the insurmountable um, amount of paperwork as well as coaching. But wondering what was the was there like a quote unquote biggest challenge that you uh, ran into when serving the small businesses and entrepreneurs? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, we, this project was so insightful because it, like I said, it allowed us to get really close 
to what was happening to a wide variety of business sectors and small businesses. And what we found was that they were so unprepared to fill out the paperwork to apply for these programs. They didn't have their profit and loss accurately um, up to date. They didn't have their taxes done. They, they didn't really have the, the pulse on the numbers. They were so busy running the business and being, you know, trying to pivot through COVID. So we, we jumped on developing a bookkeeping program where we were connecting bookkeepers to these businesses and just started helping them get up to speed so that they could apply for all these funds and weren't left behind. That was um, a, a really big challenge that we saw right away and started working with them over time. And it's proved to be very successful. Thank you. So you not only identified a challenge, uh, but you also worked to, to create a solution, which is so valuable. Uh, let's go now. Uh, let's, let's take a step up and let's go to the state level. Let's talk to Kayla and Debbie with Kansas Department of Commerce. Uh, curious to know, um, just with all of the work that you've done and really being uh, a key ambassador and almost a pioneer in the CDG, CB, CDBG space, are there any lessons that you would or could share with us uh, that could prove to be valuable um, about your process? Sure. Um, I think that uh, Debbie had some specific information or specific thoughts on um, being mindful about IDIS and um, having the information there. So Debbie, do you want to talk about that? I can tell you the greatest thing we did was do all of these um, grants to small businesses, which were necessarily needed. Um, the flip side of that the worst part of doing all the businesses we did was every one of those had to be listed separately in the federal tracking system and drawn separately and jobs done separately to close them out, which was very time consuming on state time to get other issues done. So I can say that was probably the hardest thing. The other thing I kind of wanted to bring up from what Kayla's discussion was earlier, you've seen the numbers where we showed CDBG program income. Well, what the state did is when COVID came about, uh, back when it first started at the beginning of March before we knew we'd get any COVID money of any kind, we had between 40 to 50 local program income accounts that we had got from, uh, we had done clear back in the 80s. And there was a lot of those that had used their funds. So what we forced them to do was to use their local funds before they could be eligible to come in for any of our CV money um, so that we could get those out. And that's where the $4.9 million um, went out. They either had to do it, we allowed them to do it as grants or low interest. And by low interest, we said 1% or less. Some of them get, did it as forgivables. We kind of had those that did it as grants, we were probably happy because then we don't have to deal with that program income account out there anymore and track it. So we were happy to have all that done. So that was something I forgot to mention, um, Evelyn and, and all those that we, uh, we kind of utilized a, a program that was already in existence that had, had been kind of underutilized or a little bit dormant on the local level um, to get those dollars back out there. And as most of you have mentioned, the, um, the importance of it was to, to save those small businesses that were deeply impacted um, by, the, by the shutdowns of the economy. Um, so that was one area that we, we learned a little bit from. So, so with the, the tracking system, um, and I know the, all the work that, that Amy has done too, and, and a lot of folks have done, is collecting those documents up front or collecting that documentation up front. Um, it's kind of like we were in a situation where we were building the plane as we were flying it. 
And so if you can reverse engineer and think about, you know, what you would need on the back end, um, that I think is most helpful for sure, to make sure you've got all that information up front. And two, Amy mentioned it, that these, these people are busy. They are, they're just, they're running their business. They're trying to make sure people are, um, you know, showing up and, you know, that people are well when they're showing up. So asking them for their proof of payments and proof of documentation up front is actually benefiting both the program and the recipient as well. Um, Because there's nothing worse than months down the road trying to find, you know, a receipt or an invoice or something like that. And it just feels kind of like an extra burden that wasn't wasn't necessary. Um, The other thing that we, I would say another lesson learned, uh, this is the last comment I'm going to make on this one, Evelyn, is that um, we've talked about duplication of benefit. And we also learned in Kansas that by round three of CDBJCB, we no longer needed to include meal programs um, because USDA had come out so strongly to support meal programs across the United States. Um, Fortunately, that that was really an underutilized, um, you know, it wasn't utilized as much as we thought it was going to be originally. And so, you know, reaching out to those partners, um, you know, both locally and on a regional and federal level of what is what they are coming out with, what they're rolling out or what they're considering rolling out and communicating your own program as well um, and your own, you know, beneficiaries is really important if it might touch another one of those areas so that you can, you know, you can plan accordingly um, and not have to de-obligate funds. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for that. Uh, Let's go. So now let's talk about the ecosystem. Um, And so Elizabeth, you shared so many systems level um, nuggets of information, but also in a very comprehensive and laid out process. Uh, There is a question, um, which is what qualitative and quantitative sources can we use to support ecosystem mapping for small businesses? And just as an add-on, how in the world do you get started? (laughs) Thanks, Evelyn. I'd say to get started, find out who's already having that conversation uh, and what they've already collected. You'll be surprised at how much you can collect that, um, that you didn't know existed. And then also to utilize, you know, anchor institutions. There are often classes um, that do studios and might take you on as a project and do that research and pull that data for you. Uh, But for qualitative, I think the best place to start is to have interviews, um, to talk to people that are on the ground doing the work or in other agencies that are supporting the work. The conversation will will be beneficial no matter what you find out because you'll be making a connection. And maybe you will bring somebody else into the process and into the fold and make them an advocate to help you in your efforts. Um, So first have conversations, talk to people, take stock of what's already there. For qualitative, there are Federal Reserve reports, there's SBA reports, there might be local plans that have been developed in your market, like a SEDS. Um, There might be, you know, a place on social media or a website where information about your locality lives. Um, So check that place out understanding that that's not how everybody works. Um, but sometimes you can go to meeting minutes for certain committees and you'll get information there that you that you may not have known about. For quantitative research, you know, one of the things that we're doing as a follow-up to the playbook is to figure out what resources work best or are available in, in rural areas, because I know that a lot of the resources that were presented on the webinar we did and that might be highlighted in the guide, um, you don't, might not be applicable. So we're, we're, we are looking at that, but some things that, you know, that are available, it's US Census, um, Opportunity Insights Economic Tracker. You know, you can request loan data from local banks and CDFI partners and ask them, you know, who's getting denied a loan? What are the characteristics of those businesses? And maybe that's how you target your, the efforts of one of your programs. And so to understand where the gaps are, do an assessment on, um, on the service that are available, have conversations with people, pull data when you can, 
and use all of that to, uh, to create a more coordinated approach to small business recovery. Awesome. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. We are at 3.26 p.m. Um, Justin, I am going to hand over uh, final thoughts to you. Um, for everyone that's attended, uh, my last few words to you will be thank you so much for hanging in there with us. We hope that you've learned a lot. Um, but again, Justin. Thanks so much, Evelyn. I just want to e echo that thank you to our partners in Kansas and at the Franklin County CDC and our colleague Elizabeth. Um, we will have closing remarks um, from ICF about where this uh, can be accessed. And again, want to thank HUD um, for joining us today and uh, providing some additional input around CDBG CV. So if we can, ICF, can you please um, share where they can access the recording? Thank you so much. The recording and uh, materials will be made available on the HUD exchange and the, on the class page uh, for this session. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us.